Welcome. Thank you today for joining us, our panel team here. It's an all-star team, a panel discussion around the power of collaboration. And that's rethinking how we present pathways to youth. Um, before we get started, I want to encourage everyone to please ask questions and please make this as interactive as possible. And with that, I will start on Nina Hayes. I'm your moderator today and I work for Fit First Technologies. I'm the vice president of Workforce Strategies and Innovation. I think that's my title today. Um, I have about 30 years of experience working with companies and individuals around employee-centric solutions and really focusing on what I call the life cycle of the employee. And that includes pre-employment as well. So career exploration, pre-employment, talent acquisition, all the way through to retirement. Um, I also, in my spare time, I volunteer as an executive director in the Dallas-Fort Worth area um, for a company called Room Redux. It's a nonprofit. And we aid in the healing process for children who have suffered abuse or neglect. And with that, I will introduce our all-star panel. I'll start with Deborah Soul, who is with Vegas PBS. Deborah is the Director of Workforce Development Training and Economic Development. And Deborah is based in Nevada. So Deborah, welcome. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to Dr. Candy Hoy with Dallas College. And Candy is the director of True Pathways based in Texas. Hi. Welcome, Thank you. Candy. <laughs> I didn't see you for a moment there. And Natasha Sherwood, who is the executive director of the Independent Electrical Contractors, also known as IEC, Florida West Coast, and the president of the Florida Apprenticeship Association. Natasha is based in Florida. So welcome, Natasha. Thank you. Glad to be here. And last but not least, of course, is Jan Vanderhoop, who is the president and founder of Fit First Technologies. And Jan is based in Canada. So welcome one and all. Let's get this party started. Sweet. Thanks. Thank you, Nina. Um, Thank you. So welcome, everybody. I, I, I keep introducing this as, um, you know, I feel like the hapless guy in the movie who walks into the restaurant and sees four girlfriends sitting in a booth, old, mm -hmm. old girlfriends sitting in a booth comparing notes. Um, and, and so this is, this is a really exciting opportunity, I think, for me to have a proud Papa moment. I, let me let me put that in context because I, I feel as though we've been building this technology and this business for a long time. So to, to me, it certainly feels like a long time, and and we're suddenly finding ourselves at the point where we've you know we over time we've been lucky to attract some absolutely wonderful partners who see the potential in the technology that we've built and are seizing the opportunity to to serve up that technology and to use it productively in some very creative ways. And so just to, to set the table for a little bit before we um, hand you over to, uh, to Deborah and to Candy and to Natasha, you know, we've, we've been in the business for about 20 years now almost of um, using behavioral job matching technology as a way to improve the outcomes in hiring decisions. And for most of that time, our focus has been on employers it's really in the last half dozen years that um, that we've been um, using that technology the other way around as well. So when we built it for employers, it was geared to screen through hundreds of applicants. And instead of looking for the right resumes in the pile, help employers find the people in the applicant pool who are naturally better suited to the job that's waiting for them. And what we've been able to demonstrate over, over time is um, when it starts with suitability and not credentials, the employer is going to find people who are naturally better suited to the reality that's waiting for them there. They're typically going to start more quickly. They're going to put down roots more quickly. They're going to um, be more productive. They're going to take friction out of the operation and they're going to stay longer. And, and so, um, you know, there, there's a strong argument for employers to focus on making sure the fit's right 
because it just makes good business sense and it shows up very quickly in the in the PL statement. In this upside down version, what we've been doing is using the same technology the other way around. And instead of using it to screen hundreds of people for fit in a job, what we've been doing is making it available to individuals and to organizations who work with those individuals. And so those are the people that you're going to meet today who are in, the, in these organizations. But using it as a way to get people dialed into what occupations, what, what opportunities, what types of careers um, are naturally going to lead to better outcomes for them. And, and so those are the stories that are going to resonate, I think, as we go through this. Um, every one of the folks you're going to hear from today are doing incredible work. They're removing barriers for veterans, for youth, for uh, second chance, for I mean, all of these stories that you're going to hear and achieving absolutely remarkable things. So sure, that's a good news story. You're going to hear a bunch of good news stories today, but it's actually more than good news. It's critically important. And here are the reasons why it's so critically important. If you look at if you look at the statistics, um, you know, sure, people are always talking about the unemployment rates and how the workforce is shrinking. And it is, you know, you look at demographics, demographics are not our friend. We are, as a population, we're aging. It's not just a US thing or a North American thing. It's a um, the only country in the world now that is actually growing headcount is India. Uh, and they've got more than enough opportunities at home that they don't need to export their people necessarily. Um, and so we're facing a situation where we've got to make do with less. But the, the sad truth is, if you look at this slide, what it, what it should be shouting at you is we don't have less. The fact is we've got 27 million people on the sidelines, people who are not in the workforce, in many cases, are desperately trying to get into the workforce. And the challenge is they are well and truly invisible to employers because they don't have the kind of, they haven't been exposed to the kinds of opportunities. So if you think, for example, of the groups that I mentioned earlier on veterans, uh, people with disabilities, um, people coming out of the correctional system, youth who are trying to find their path, coming out of some pretty tough situations. None of those people have the kind of education and experience that looks pretty in a resume or has the keywords in their resume that employers are looking for as a starting point in terms of deciding who they're going to look at and who they're going to ignore. And so we've got 27 million people who are perfectly well suited to most of those jobs that employers are screaming to fill. And there's Last time I checked the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce numbers, we're running at about nine and a half million unfilled jobs in the U.S. economy today. There's more than enough people to fill those jobs. Employers just aren't seeing them. So you look at that as part of what's broken. You look at the fact that there's nearly 40 million people who've started but not finished college for whatever reason. Um, you know, 40 percent of people who've graduated are working as baristas and Uber drivers because they can't find either either the the education that they pursued is leading them up the wrong pathway to for, you know leading towards jobs that don't exist or employers just aren't seeing them. So either way, what we what we see in the workforce is huge dysfunction and um, and, and nobody's getting what they need when they really should be. And so what what got us started way back in the beginning was trying to understand what it is that's broken about this process of matching talent with opportunity. And when we started the work, it was an employer centric thing. It was really trying to understand why employers are having so much trouble finding the right people, why they're dealing with chronic levels of turnover and disengagement. And, and one of the studies that we ran across, which actually has become a pivot point for us in our conversation with employers is something as simple as this study that came out of, uh, an academic setting in the UK where they were studying the predictive value of each of the bits of information employers would collect about people as they're taking them through the, the, the selection process. And what you see down the left-hand side is the, the, the data points, the bits of information that employers collect. What you see down the middle of the page is the predictive value of each of those components. The higher the number, the better. And so immediately what leapt out to us when we saw this study is Employers have been relying for decades on the resume to help them decide who they're going to pay attention to and who they're going to ignore without realizing that even if it's true, the stuff in the resume is the weakest predictor of someone's likelihood of success in the job. I mean, that, that is that in itself is 
totally broken. And the pieces that are most reliably predictive, that employers should be leaning on more in their, in their decision-making process, is rather than what the person knows, who are they as an individual? What's their behavioral makeup? How compatible are they with, with as I said earlier, the reality that's waiting for them here in my organization? And how do they, how do they match with the people around them um, as they're getting through their, uh, through their day? And so all of our methodology has been centered on flipping this chart and starting from who the person is, either for employers to help them understand the individuals that they should be talking to first, and for individuals, giving them the information to better understand who they are and the kinds of opportunities they're naturally to find most rewarding and where they're going to thrive. And we've and so we've leaned into some very detailed um, behavioral science. It's based, it's built on the Big Five model. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but you know the the we're, we're getting a very comprehensive 360 degree view of the individual in terms of who they are as a person, how they show up at work how they build relationships and, and work with others, uh, how do they deal with change and how do they deal with challenge and adversity. And, and so as a composite, that's a very um, complete view of the individual. And, and as we have that picture of a person, we can then project them into a library of occupations and help them understand what their best picks are likely to be. And so the job to my platform, which Debra and Candy and Natasha are all going to be talking to you about today is really a, um, a three-sided model where we've got employers on one side of the job matching engine. We've got individuals on the other side. And these three organizations who are here today really are the intermediaries who are, who are in the middle working to properly introduce the right individuals to the right upscaling and training opportunities so we can connect them with the right with the right occupations and the right employers. And that really is the model that sits at the center of everything that you're gonna be hearing about today. So for employers, what we often hear is because we're, we're reducing the reliance on the resume, um, invariably we help them diversify their workforce. They end up in conversation with uh, this is this is a phrase that we stole from one of our one of our clients who said you know what one one of the things we love about this approach is we keep finding great people in surprising packages we're hiring people who are a great addition to the team who we would never have looked at in a million years based on anything in their resume and 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 they're staying longer they're doing better they're adding great value to the organization this works also on the flip side of the coin. So the, 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 the broader picture, which you're gonna be hearing at least from Deborah and probably to, to, to a large degree from the others as well is there's two angles to this and, the, and it really is two sides of the same hand. You know, we, we talk about it in, in, in this audience as workforce development. When we're out in the world, we're talking about it as economic development. And yet they're one and the same. You know, you, can, you, you can't have economic development without having a ready trained workforce that's going to create the um, uh, the momentum in the local economy that's going to make the difference and that's going to create a self-sustaining self-perpetuating engine that continues to improve outcomes and so with that um, Deborah if, if I may I think I'd, I'd like to hand it over to you to um, introduce yourself and to set the stage a little bit around, around what you've been up to with your team in Vegas well, good afternoon and thank you. Um, I, this is a, is a program and just a, a little bit, bit about me. I've been in the education industry uh, for over 30 years, having been a dean of two different community colleges and always working in the um, non-funded workforce development side or the continuing ed um, side of what most com community colleges call their workforce initiatives. So. Um, always working with individuals and in business and industry on programs and services that was going to meet their need. So, um, and, and now I'm at PBS and yeah, that is public television. And most people say, well, why PBS? And um, being uniquely located in Las Vegas um, prior to the recession before COVID, the great recession, um, Nevada had been one of the fastest growing um, cities in the country for over 20 years. Um, casinos continuing to pop. We were building a school a month. Um, 
very low unemployment. Um, it was really an employer's or an employee's market. And, and we kind of find ourselves in that today if you're positioned correctly. Um, but at that time, we could either launch a television show to show people how to get a job, or we could launch a full-blown workforce initiative. We chose to do the latter. So I was fortunate enough to write the strategic plan and implement it. And since 2010, we now are fully entrenched in that market. And one of the things about PBS is we, we really, um, in our mission and everything that we do is to create an informed and engaged community through high tech, high touch experiences. Our workforce initiative is very high tech, high touch. Um, and our success in, in the programs that we're delivering is actually shown in our outcomes. Next slide, please. Education is actually totally in our DNA. Um, it is what founded PBS. Workforce development has then emerged out of that, We're highly engaged in technology and new technology as it emerges. And then obviously as a television station, our local productions. So, but I'm not here to talk about our local productions, although everybody has their favorite um, PBS story or character. What we have found is we often hear, I didn't know you do that. I didn't know you did that. Uh, because we don't really always tout our own successes. Even though we, uh, it, uh, we are all about the communities that we serve, um, our whole goal is to deliver high quality programming, um, free or cost-effective educational workforce training opportunities that empower our community beyond our broadcast. So it's not just about what we put on television, it's what makes our community tick. Next slide, please. Workforce education is what I'm here to talk about and Joptimize is at the very center of it. Um, we actually started using Joptimize just um, prior to COVID. Uh, we signed a contract and with our goal of taking this statewide. In fact, we named our initiative Nevada Joptimize. Um, launched it initially in a youth incarceration camp um, and looked at alternatives for how do we change the trajectory or outcome for these students that are actually incarcerated, adjudicated, not tried, that if they had the right training could actually gather um, elective credits in order to graduate and then have opportunities in order to move forward. So that's where we started it. And, and during COVID, we had, quite frankly, a captive audience. They weren't going anywhere. Uh, so we were able to really get that started and uh, use the model. Unfortunately, Joptimize was really quick when we had couldn't get the technology working up there. We did pencil paper, then we got it in the system and were able to match that. So our students could actually use the opportunity to look at career exploration or what were the areas that they were most um, uh, not resilient to, but that, that they actually had the biggest gap. Ironically, classes that our, our incarcerated kids chose weren't the career exploration. They were choosing courses like problem solving, how to deal with difficult people, all of those soft skills, critical thinking skills, and that was really a surprise to us. But the nice part, they were also getting elective credit, bonus points at the camp so that they could spend more time, get a pizza party or whatever. Um, so our kids up in our, our incarcerated incarceration area, um, actually we continued that program and now we bring in guest speakers, industries that they're interested in, uh, that are on their profile so that they can talk and figure out what, what will my next job be. We can um, roll the next slide, please. Um, with Joptimize, we have over 350 plus career training programs that we match people to, as well as over 1,250 short-term career exploration or OSHA classes that can be used for individuals as well as um, businesses when they're upskilling their workforce. Next slide, please. So. Joptimize is one of our newest collaborative partner. Again, we look at it as high tech, high touch opportunities that we're able to not only be a central uh, party to, but as a PBS station, we are, we, we're neutral. Um, we actually want 
the services that we provide be extended to all of our workforce partners, all of our education partners, but we're the hub in Southern Nevada right now due to a, next slide please, um, a 1.7 or $1.07 million ARPA grant that has allowed us to go into all the different schools, um, uh, our universities, our workforce partners, um, that, that to connect people that are coming to the workforce system to the right programs, the right training provider. It's not necessarily going to be us. I just told you about the Spring Mountain Youth Grant, and that grant now we're, we'll be starting our fifth year in that grant um, with the successes that we've had. And then this next year, moving it to our female um, youth incarceration camp for young, young females. The City of Las Vegas ARPA grant and our Clark County grant not only allowed us to go into our businesses, um, all of our uh, small business, because we looked at turnover being our highest turnover and our har hardest to keep open during COVID. So the whole goal of an ARPA grant is to keep, to connect our businesses with qualified talent pool, as well as keep our businesses doors open. So it's allowed us to not only serve the business side of um, the talent sorter within the Joptimize system, but the workforce education system. We are in all of our um, public universities and community colleges in Southern Nevada. And we're in the K-12 system and public libraries. We're in all of Clark County's public libraries. And we're launching that in order to get Youth, it's kind of the chicken and the egg approach is what I told Jan when we first started this, is you want to have candidates in the pipeline in order to serve the businesses that are coming there. So do you have the businesses first to attract the, the candidates or the candidates there first to attract the businesses? Um, fortunately, we've been able to, up, to um, actually launch the program simultaneously in order to have businesses that are in that system. Whenever we hold focus groups on business, the first thing they say is, my turnover is due to people being the wrong fit for my company, um, which is really an open door for us to be able to come back in and say, let me tell you about a program that can help you find that right fit. For those companies that are using it right now, they're saying it has a, a streamlined their hiring process. They are actually able, they can open a job and sort by those who have done the job demise assessment. For our K-12, as well as our workforce system, it's the ability to match people to jobs and careers that they are most suited to do so that if they are using WIOA funding or they are using some other kind of federal, local, uh, vocational rehab funding, you're training people for jobs that if they go into, they'd be suited to and the likelihood of them staying there would be short what it's done, and one of our greatest programs that I want to tell everyone about is our, our program with Goodwill. We actually launched a pilot and wondered how was it going to be, where we took a one-year career program in certified medical admin assistant. We condensed it down to 14 weeks, um, and Goodwill actually has their own job optimized portal through our ARPA grant. All of the students must take the assessment. They also complete an application with us as well as with Goodwill. What we're finding is they complete a one-year program in nine to 11 weeks. They are all certifying, they are in internships, and in less than three months, they have employment. So when you look at that fast track, and yes, we facilitate, they are expected if you are unemployed in this program, you're going to be in your training program 40 hours a week without fail, but they are motivated. It's the program that they want to be in, and they're exceptionally successful. We're looking at launching that now to some other industries that are in demand, cybersecurity, some of our apprenticeship pre-prep programs. Um, but it's just been an amazing program. We are launching, as soon as I get back from this conference, uh, we are launching cohort six now. And we launched the initial pilot in November. So we're doing one a month. 
where they're overlapping and we're seeing the success in mentorship within the students, but 100% uh, retention in the program and 100% completion going into externships. I don't know any other program that can say that. And again, having a partner like Goodwill to be that other high tech, high touch, we both will launch it together, set those expectations. We know who those students are. We know what their soft spots are. And we know the areas that we need to work on. So with that, uh, we'll entertain any questions in the chat and I'm gonna turn it over to Nina. I'll save you, Nina. Actually, actually, what, what, what we're so thank you for that. And and in in the real world, when we're in the room, I expect there's going to be a bit of a buzz and a bit of you know some conversation about what. Wait, you you're, you you could shrink a year long program down to what because you're getting the right people in the right seats. I mean that's yeah. that's pretty amazing. Um, and so speaking of uh, people in seats and um, you know, leaning into opportunities to get people down the right pathways for them. I think that's a beautiful segue to uh, to Candy. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Candy Hoy. I am with Dallas College in Dallas, Texas, and I serve as the director of True Pathways. A little bit about myself. I am the student that we serve. I am a first generation full Pell Grant eligible student. Um, and with that, you don't necessarily always have the same uh, opportunities and resources as individuals who may not be first generation or, or full Pell Grant. And this is the specific reason why I went into education, because of how it transformed my life and how I know it can transform the lives of others. I have experience at the community college and the university levels. I really enjoy the community college um, because the community, community college will see a problem and then they will say, let's fix it right now. And that's a really, a really great part about the community college is the community aspect of it. As I said, I serve as the director of True Pathways at Dallas College. True stands for Texas Reskilling and Upskilling Through Education. Um, we create short-term stackable credentials so the students can have their own and off ramps. So we might have a student that comes in and they get a CompTIA A plus certification and they go to work but then they may wanna come back and build on top of that and do server plus, and then they can go to work after that. And then they may wanna come back and do network and so on and so forth. So our purpose here in Career Connected Learning at Dallas College is to get students the right training and the right fit to go out and get a job and be able to have a sustainable wage here. I also manage a number of different grants, uh, the True Grant, which is something that helps students with tuition assistance. Also in CCL, we have a number of grants. We have the Adult Basic Education Literacy Grant. We have WIOA, the Youth Grant. We have TRUE. We have all these funds for students. And it's very important that we put these students in the right program because the funds might not fund additional programs. So this is why Joptimize is so important. We want to make sure that the student is in the right fit and that they are getting the training to make sure that they are successful while they're here at Dallas College. Dallas College, we have seven campuses. We recently just went through a revamp. So we were seven separately accredited institutions, and now we are one institution. And we have a lot of moving pieces right now at the time. Um, Jan has been a part of that from basically the jump during the, the merger and everything like that. So he's been able to go in the ebbs and flows and in and, and all the craziness <laughs> that we have sometimes at Dallas College with uh, all of the moving pieces. We're one of the largest community colleges in Texas. If you know Texas is big, that's what we do. We are known for being big. We tell you everything is bigger and better in Texas, and we have a large population of students. Specifically in Career Connected Learning, we have our workforce education, uh, which trains students, like I said, at little to no cost. This is where we have our high school equivalency, our ESL, we have other programs, IETs. Those are going to be your short professional degrees or certificates like a Google professional cert. And then you can build on top of that with like an OSA where you can possibly do help desk on top of that. And then you'll go into your career connected learning where we will transition or we would articulate that CE credit or that CE coursework to the credit side so that students can not only start in the CE area, but they're going to continue 
and go on to uh, a bachelor's degree, master's or a doctorate if that's something that they choose. So we are we really take into account making sure that we align everything with industry recognized credentials. And then we wanna make sure that, that those uh, CE courses articulate to the credit side. So Joptimize is amazing. I love Joptimize. One of the cool things, I'm gonna start with the last bullet point first. One of the cool things about Joptimize, it's a cheat sheet. So if you have a team and you're the supervisor, have your team do Joptimize because it teaches you about your team and your team about you. So now you have a better, better way to interact and to make this position or the position that your team is, is in a fit for them as they are right now. So they may have come into this position and it wasn't a good fit, but if you learn their behavior, you can make this a fit for them. So that was an amazing thing that we got to do. One of my coworkers is in school. She didn't know what she wanted to do. And she took Joptimize and she wanted me there with her when she was doing her, her debrief with Mike from Joptimize. And then I was like, hold up, wait, wait, wait. This is a cheat code. I get to learn about my coworker and, and what, what she's good at and what she isn't. Public speaking isn't her thing. Okay, I won't have her doing public speaking, but if I can lay down a track and give her certain details about that, she will take it and run and that's all that she needs. So that was an amazing thing that we found out. And I was like, everybody at Dallas College needs to do Joptimize so that we can learn about each other. It's not necessarily the skills. You only know what you've already learned, but your behavior is with you your whole life. So when we're able to take this and make the current job that you're in a fit, it's amazing. That's how you're going to have longevity in that position. So I know I started with uh, the last thing, but it was so amazing to be able to see. So after my coworker did it, I was like, well, we have to debrief me so that she knows about me and I know about her. And after that, we, we, we just work so well together. It's a great tool. As far as the student side, this is a great tool for our students. Again, uh, Joptimize has been great with working with us. They, they, They've been able to mold and change and do things to make sure that everything is gorgeous, that students understand, and that we are able to debrief our students. So like I said, we have all of these grants, but they only fund one program. So we need these students to take this Joptimize tool on the front end so that we can filter them into, their, into the right trainings, right? Also, again, it's a cheat code. Joptimize is a cheat code. Students might not necessarily know words that describe them, but Joptimize will tell them. You just put those words in your resume. You just put those words in your cover letter. You don't have to think about this. Joptimize has done the work for you. If you don't know the word, Google it, but use it because it's going to be some good words and some good information that is going to help that student describe themselves. It's hard to describe yourself when somebody says, tell me a little bit about you. Uh, I like dogs. I don't know, but Joptimize has already done this for you and it is able to tell you a little bit more about you. Also, Joptimize is connected to ONET. So once a student finishes their Joptimize, it'll show them in ONET, which is a big place where all these jobs are, right? And it's specific here in DFW. Hey, these are the jobs that are a good fit for you. These are the skills that you lack. And then if you get that, this will be a great fit for you. You take that job, you take that job fit um, pool with you or your, 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 what is the word? Or plan, your plan when you finish with uh, Joptimize, take that to job interviews. Hey, uh, it says that I'm a 98% fit for your position. Let me tell you a little bit about your, myself. And this is why. Joptimize has been a great tool and I love it. It is, um, it's great with everything in all different aspects. So we focus again, um, like Deborah was saying earlier, she has so many, she has her um, returning citizens, our workforce. Dallas College, we, we serve everyone. We serve the community. So we have returning citizens, we have our high school, we have our emeritus with your, your senior citizens. We have all of these people who have come through our doors. About 130,000 students who were somewhere but they may not have completed yet. So let's capture those students and give them a reason to come back and train so they can go out and get that livable wage. Um, we wanna strengthen our local talent pool. So we wanna make sure that again, you're a good fit. The skills are one thing, but it's all about your behavior, right? So we wanna make sure that 
we're going to be able to put 130 plus stu 130,000 plus students in the right fit in the right job. Employers are very, oh, we need bodies, we need bodies, we need bodies. Well, we don't have bodies, we have students. And we wanna make sure that those students are in the right place and the right fit for them. What good does it do if we train a student and they are only in a position for three months? We wanna make sure that those students are in the right spot and in the right fit. And we need employers to understand, hey, I, I, I know you have a need and these are the students that have the aptitude and whose behavior is a good fit for you. We wanna make sure that our students are successful in your company and we want to make sure that your company has a talent pool that is going to stay and that is sustainable. Anything else on that? Oh yes, look at this. This is our entire eco ecosystem. So again, with Dallas College, we have referrals from the workforce board, high schools, cousins, aunts, uncles, all kind of people come to Dallas College and they say, hey, I, I want to get a job. I, I, I need to get a job. I can't, I'm not going to do a two-year degree. I need a job in six months or less. What kind of training? What's a good fit for us? So we have all of our referrals, right? Joptimize is going to be able to sort those students out. So a student might say, hey, you know what? I think I'm going to go into IT. But then Joptimize might say, you know, no, no. That, that might not be a good fit for you. What we're seeing is, is this. And so instead of pigeonholing a student into something where they, they might not know as much about that field or anything, hey, let's look at what who you are through your job, or your job optimized tool and let's make a good fit for you. So IT may have been what you wanted to do when you came in, but that's not the fit for you. But here at Dallas College, we have trainings in other areas which will be a good fit for you and you're going to be successful and you're going to keep to, you're going to go on and again, maybe get that bachelor's, master's and, and so on and so forth. So we want to make sure that we're putting, we have our referrals, we build a talent pool, Joptimize is going to sort the, that for us. And then we put those students in different areas. Maybe they're ready to go to work. Maybe they're like, you know what? I, 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 I can go to work right now. They're, I'm not missing any skills. Let's go ahead and go to work right now. Or, hey, you need some more skills. You need some more training. Let's let's take you here or mm, this isn't your fit. Let's let's sit down. Let's have a conversation and see what some other places that may be of interest to you. And then you go on into the workforce. Now you're in the workforce. Now you're confident. Now you're ready to come back and get that second certificate or that third certificate. Or you're like, you know what? I'm ready to go ahead and get this associate's degree because. Yep, that's what I want to do. I want to get this associate degree. Now I want to go on and get my bachelor's. And then what we want is those success stories to come back and tell our students and our population about how this tool was able to help them and assist them throughout their educational career. Jan, did you add to that? You no, know, I mean, what you what you said really underscores why I'm so excited about the relationship with Dallas College, which is the, you know, you, you're, you're one of the visionary institutions that's really working very hard to position yourself in the center of the, the community, right, as sort of the convener, the one who sits between these pools of people who are on the outside looking in, trying to find a, 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 an entry point into the, into the workforce, and employers who are desperate for those people. And, and to your point, and this slide is just one example of, you know, how that conversation manifests itself in the work that you do. But, you know, often you get people coming to you saying, should I be X? And you might say to them, sure. And, and you don't need us. So let's let's connect you directly with employers. Or it might be, yeah, this is something you're really well suited to, but you need to get this certificate or you need to spend this time with it. And so you're able to convert that potential into something that is usable by employers very quickly. And you're going to get people coming to you on a regular basis saying, you know, I want to be X and you might be able to sit back with them and say, well, I don't think X is really all that great for you. Okay. And here, and here are the reasons why, but guess what? It, it, you know, according to your results, it looks like you're a dead ringer for these careers in logistics or for these careers in aircraft maintenance or in healthcare or what have you. And Oh, by the way, Dallas college can prepare you for those two. And so it, this is one of those magical situations where because of who Dallas College is and who you are as humans there, you're in a position where you, you can be that Uber. Going back to your previous slide, that Uber that takes people from where they are to where they want to be. Mm -hmm. And nobody gets left behind. And that's, that's I think, a critical piece. And, and so 
thank you for that. And uh, and Natasha, I'm I'm going to hand it over to you, um, because you know that that segue of people being left behind, I think, is a really right place for you to jump off. Absolutely, thank you, Jan. Um, so my name is Natasha Sherwood, and so um, they kind of mentioned I do um, the executive director at Independent Electrical Contractors. And that's where this first conversation kind of started with Jan. And, and so I'm also president of Florida Apprenticeship Association. So that is literally what it says, all the apprenticeship organizations in the state. Um, I sit on our apprenticeship council as well as our career and technical education um, board. And so um, that's somewhat where this passion kind of uh, started for those left behind. But I wasn't necessarily doing maybe due diligence and how to help those individuals. Um, as it says in there, I'm a recovering college for all addict. And that's absolutely true. I was a principal for a low income school um, where I thought that I was going to save all of my students by getting them to a four-year college and getting them scholarships and all of these awesome ideas because my goal as a fifth generation Floridian was to make my state better. And um, I just thought I knew it all. And um one of my students called me one day, we had gotten a full ride to a local state university. Um, and by full ride, I mean the whole thing, tuition, food, dining, you name it. And um, he called and he said, hey, hey, coach, can I come by and chat? And I said, well, um, well, for first, can I set you up to talk to all the seniors about college? And he said, yeah, I hate college. I don't want to do this. I want to work on cars. And that's what my passion is. And I realized at that point that I had missed completely what I wanted to do and what my passion was, but I'd also missed for him. And so, um, in doing that, I started to explore opportunities. And when I left there, I went to run an association that provides apprenticeships. And those are for many times students that um, sometimes got left behind or left out or what their passions were, were not considered because um, we lived in a society of, you know, four years for everyone. And that was going to be the solution. And it is a great opportunity. Um, my two oldest are, well, one's in college and one's heading to college and a great opportunity, but not the only possibility. And having to fight for my second child to be able to take career and technical education courses because no one assessed what she would be good at. Um, and they just assumed because she had 4.0s that she would be a college bound student really opened my eyes. And that's about the time that I met Jan. And we started talking about what could we do to really open the eyes of um, middle school students and, and all kinds of individuals before they got to that terminal point. And that's where this relationship started and kind to really network in and work with other individuals. And that was working with the school systems with Jan and with students to selfishly bring them into the electrical industry, because it would be great if they all took um, job to mize and they all ended up being um, wanting to be an electrical contractor. But in the bigger picture in the Florida apprenticeship, the idea was to provide the services that our um, association does, which is everything from legislative services and education and providing CEU training for those individuals who are already electricians, but also providing a statewide registered apprenticeship program for more than 400 students. I think we're at like 480 um, as of today with about 20 more starting in, in about a week across um, the entire state. But then we started seeing all these partners, right? So this is where it became the idea of where do we network and how do we bring in partners to find those jobs? And Jan, you said earlier, there like 27 million or something unfilled jobs. In Florida alone, we have 500,000 unfilled jobs. I just got the email um, last week. And I started saying, I, I know where these people are. And it came from the organizations such as Department of Juvenile Justice, Corrections, Career Source, Enterprising Latinas. There are the employees out there. And as Jan kind of started showing us, we just have to help finding them. So our focus moved a little bit from what we had looked at from in independent um, electrical contractors and finding apprentices only in these high school kids it's where else are the workers? Because one of my contractors told me, you know, five years ago, if anybody had two arms and two legs, we would hire them and train them. And that was great. And um, because that's what apprenticeship is. But he said right now, he'll take anybody who can fog up a mirror. He's not really worried if they have two arms or two legs. I don't know how that works in the electrical industry. I'm waiting for him to actually show me. But um, I know it's right. Because as you also point, pointed out, Jan, economic development and workforce development go hand in hand. And right now, we have so many people moving to Florida and so many jobs that my contractors can't bid on jobs. They can't even put a bid on the job because they don't have the labor to fill it. So I had, um, we started working with corrections and reached out with Jan and, and we were able to use Joptimize to help these individuals who were in what's called supervision, parole or probation. And this allowed them to help the corrections department find careers for them because um, they didn't know what they wanted to do, but to stay on probation or parole, they needed to find a job. So they were motivated, but had no clue what to do. 
So we started with corrections and then I didn't move enough. So the light went out. Um, and so um, they, we went from corrections into um, a young man emailed me and said, I have a question. Will I meet the policies and procedures for your organization if I have a background? I said, well, please share more. And he said, I have a second degree murder felony that I received when I was 16 years old and I spent 25 years in prison. And um, I, I, you know, took a step back and I was like, well, we're, we're going to do something. We're going to try this. He sent me his resume, very clear, no work history, none, because he's been in jail since he, prison since he was 16 um, and no real education except for what he got in prison. And so we opened it up. We actually took it. He, he scored well for him. You know, we're looking kind of at this and we found him a job in 48 hours. Um, and he was in our apprentice program. And at that point, I knew this was a market or where we could find employees who needed a job. And DJJ was um, had a new department they've created, Department of Juvenile Justice, for workforce and education, taking the individual youth that we were learning the right terms, youth that are in the facilities. Um, there's 44 facilities and there are um, 1,700 youth in our um, in our state. We are, the plan then was to take these students before they reached that point where they would be in prison and let's start job optimizing them. I turned it into a verb. I don't know if that's okay or not, Jan, but job optimizing is now a verb. And so we're, we're job optimizing these students. And then our Department of Juvenile Justice on July 1 becomes its own school district. And so instead of just getting them high school diplomas and GEDs, which when they're done, then what do they do? They're just done. Um, now we're providing um, skills and training and pre-apprenticeship moving into apprenticeship based on job optimize. So we'll be job optimizing these students who then, if they're a good fit for electrical, goes into this writing a new story, a conduit to success, pun, pun completely intended because my background's in public relations, so why not make it remember, you know, memorable. And um, so we literally go out um, and we're reaching to all the students as they come in through D Department of Juvenile Justice. Um, they are then being able to be relocated to one of the facilities based on the fit first. So if they are going to go into electrical, they're moving into certain facilities. If it ends up being culinary, auto tech, uh, manufacturing, solar and craft labor, all the ones we already have lined up to start with this program, they'll be able to then receive hands-on training that'll move into a job. So instead of just um, giving them their GED and their high school diploma and they wait years, you know, whatever years they have left, they're actually receiving training. Partnering then with um, Fit First along with the metric to provide some outcomes of what those skills are on the backside. The goal then is in, as we finish this part and the um, kind of life cycle of it looks up, I think is the next slide on there, um, about what, what they would do is they would come in, they're processed, they do the job optimize or they're job optimized. Um, we, you know, talk with them, hey, we feel you're a good fit because some of them may never have thought about electrical before. And one of the things I love about job optimize that I talk about with it is that it's not just what your interests or your skills are. And I talk about, I'm interested in football, but I'm five, four and 50 years old. And I would not be a good football player at this point. Like I, I probably am not getting hired as a football player. And we also know that skills that individuals come with are dependent on what their background is. Candy mentioned that she was a first generation in college and, and she was a Pell Grant recipient. She probably didn't have the same skills available to her as she came along that I did come from a middle class family in Florida. I knew I was blessed. And so skills doesn't also tell the story for an individual. So as we come in, an individual takes job demise. We talk to them about um, electrical and why they might be interested. We tell them how much money they can make, what cool cars they can drive when they get out, and then provide also the opportunity for that job on the way out, partnering with our members of our association. So this becomes a partner part. So we're partnering with job demise. We're partnering with Department of Juvenile Justice. Career Source is providing some of the um, um, training and some of the funds for it. We're moving everywhere we can to bring as many hands to support these students that we can um, to come in and have a signing day like you see for colleges, uh, you know, colleges signing kids. These kids are now signing for a career where they're going to have a lucrative um, opportunity to support their families and change their backgrounds. Um, and then we get to release day where they go back and they'll hopefully the goal is to release straight into a job where they can then complete the um OJT part, the on-the-job training. Um, and then the next slide kind of shows where we've kind of come with this. And so um, this was in the work for about nine months. Um, and then um, it, it was slow. Department of Juvenile Justice, I think as you're doing this, as you're bringing partners in, you bring more people in, but you you got to realize that sometimes it's going to be slow and convincing people. We started out thinking middle school, high, you know, middle school students, and we ended up with Department of Juvenile Justice is where we've launched and been able to get in.
Um, that launch came um, about five Fridays ago. I got a call that said, hey, we got to go ahead. Do you want to start the program? And I said, yes. Do we have students? And he goes, yes, we have a student. Can we start Monday? I said, sure. What Monday? He said, Monday, 72 hours, Monday. Sure. No problem. We can start. Um, we didn't know what time we were going to start, but we knew that the young man in the um, smiley face to the right over there, um, our very first student was ready to go, excited, and he has completed half of the pre-apprenticeship program already in five weeks because they are so excited. Um, this was our first class, and you can see there was one student. There were six adults ready to support this individual, so everybody from um, um, Department of Juvenile Justice, Florida Trade Academy, who's helping with our RTI, a transitioning expert um, that we brought in with them, um, a program, a CARES program that is uh, partnered by a major retailer that sells tools. Um, and my instructor on the bottom, who's a female African-American master electrician, who was a dean at, um, uh, at I forget, American University before she did this. And so all of these individuals supporting one person coming together, and I think it really ties together that this is about networking. It's about reaching your hands out and job optimize provides the ability for you to provide the facts to all these people. And it's what convinced all of them to jump on with us. And in the long term, what our goal is then is to provide <laughs> tipping the scales of justice, right? So these kids have so much on one side that's weighing them down. Besides the record, they probably didn't come from good backgrounds, you know, good quote. They didn't have the financial resources they might need. They probably didn't have the education. So now we're going to start dropping on the other side of Lady Justice. So, right, we're going to say they were a good fit first. We have the data. This is accurate. Our career source is going to come in and say, we have WIOA funds. They're going to get, um, you know, some paid training when they get out or some tools. We have IEC coming beside providing that RTI. We have contractors saying we're going to hire them. So when these individuals walked out, now all of a sudden those scales have somewhat evened out. And so this individual walks out with a whole new opportunity to write a new story that we've created through this conduit that Job Optimize really provides that on-ramp. And so we talked about Uber and I often talk about interstates. They all have different ways of on-ramps and they have different exit, you know, exits, right? So when that Uber gets on, he can get on on any way, 75, which runs through the middle of the state, right? So you can get on down in Key West, you can get off in Georgia. And where do you get on and where do you get off is what Job Optimize helps us get them on in those positions. And then our partners are what helps us keep them and where they get off. Um, and so this is what it looked like. It wasn't what we expected when we started um, about nine or 10 months ago, um, but it is exactly what it needs to be and exactly where we need to be. And we are so excited um, as we expand this now into manufacturing and auto tech and solar and craft labor and um, hopefully to fill some of those 500,000 unfilled jobs in the state. I thank you, everyone. I honestly, I had no idea how um, how apt the title was going to be the power of collaboration. You know, it, it it's honestly when it, it came time to submit the speaking proposal, it was something that we pulled out of thin air. And yet each of the three of you um, you know, the, the, the reason you're getting the results you are, the reason you're breaking the ground you are, is you've really stepped back and, and very deliberately thought differently about how things need to happen in the ecosystems and the, and the, and the organizations that you serve. Um, Deborah, I'm closing with this slide because it's really appropriate. Uh, and I don't, know you, I don't know if you realize this, honestly. It's a slide that came out of a conversation that, was, that, that happened in the room when I first came to Las Vegas to talk about Job to Mize three years ago, maybe? Uh, we, we've been, um, uh, my, my files go back five years. Mm. There you go, yeah. And so, and so this was a room where you had pulled together employers and people from across the community, people from the public schools, people from the community colleges, the universities, there are a few agencies there. Workforce development was there. Economic development was there. And all we had up on the, on the, on the wall behind us was the middle part, the, you know, the, 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 the overlapping circles, because that was, that was how we presented Job Optimize back in the day. And what was fascinating was the, when that slide came up, there was a bit of a buzz at the back of the room. And if I remember right, it was an executive from CVS Pharmacies, Yep. who had leaned over and, and started a bit of a whispering conversation with the person be beside them who it turned out was with Las Vegas Act Dev. And, and it was, it was, I was, I was intrigued to see what this had triggered for them. And when I, when I stopped the conversation and asked the, 
asked them what was going on for them. It was the, the CVS exec who spoke up and said, you probably don't know this, but we just signed a contract last week, I think it was, to bring a 300 or 500 seat call center to Las Vegas. And five years ago. And the, the, the he said, you know, there, there was there was there was lots of slaps on the back and champagne flowed last week when we made the announcement. But the conversation stopped pretty abruptly when I spoke to my friend here at ActDev about how we're going to fill those seats. And and he said, so do you, and, and he leaned back in his chair and he was pointing at the, the, the graphic on, on the wall and said, so do you mean to say that if Vegas, whoever, ActDev, workforce development, if, if we'd been using Joptimize for the last year, that we'd be able to come to you and say, you know, sort of by layer, you know, can you help us find people who are looking for work right now who are really well suited to these jobs in call centers and who have call center experience? And of course, the answer was, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's an easy thing to pull out of the database. And the next slice was, can you help us find people who are well suited but don't have the experience? And could we put a rope around those folks and trot them over to the, the, the folks at the community college, they, you know, diagonally across the room from us to say, can you help us prepare these folks for these jobs? But what was really interesting was, you know, as you, as you look at this particular graphic, they then started working their way backwards around the circle to say, can you help us find folks in these hidden populations that we're not already speaking to? You know, could you help us find veterans and people with disabilities and, and others who are on the sidelines for no good reason? And could you, could you help us identify those that we ought to be training up. And they also went into the, the conversation about the high schools to help us understand what our future talent was. And if we, if we, if we could find kids in high schools, could we begin a conversation with them around starting part-time or somehow create some open houses that would get them thinking about our company and our industry as a possibility for the future. And, and so, you know, I think the, 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 the power of this slide, which emerged from that conversation, the other piece that came out of that, that conversation was we had employers who were saying, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, we, we post a job, we get 400 applicants, we hire one. We've got no way of throwing the other 399 back for the other employers in the community. All right. And it's absurd. We don't have need for them. They're probably better suited to the, the employer across the street anyway. Why wouldn't we create an environment where everybody gets a fair shake and, and we can sort of share the abundance. And that's, that's really been the ethos, the philosophy that underpins, I think, all of the work that you guys are doing and, and, and what we're starting to see emerge in the work that we're doing with industries, industry associations, and in geographic regions, which, um, which is where thinking differently can become a really powerful thing. And all of a sudden, we start to get some of the inefficiency and waste out of, out of the system. Well, and yeah, if I could just say something, though, too, thing, again, I've been with this using the tool and its profiles back in the early years. And, you know, I mean, Joptimize or Fit First, you know, has taken this and put what was started on steroids. Yeah. Um, but I've always said that this tool, instead of most assessments being so negatively received by students because it screens you out or you're in the bottom this or you're in the bottom that, it screens people into opportunities and jobs that they never knew um, were possible. Mm -hmm. And so there is something for everyone, regardless of where you come from, regardless of your disability, your ethnicity, your social styles, or anything, it screens them in. And that's why going to K-12 and working with the K-12 system in as early as junior high and then going to high school, even in the college, or I do a lot with TAPS programs with veterans as they're the high level officers exiting out saying, what do I want to be next? And this tells that gives them opportunities because they all think they need to be CEOs and they find out that, wow, I can go be a, a ranger in a national park and I'm going to love it. It just, it gets people looking at life and priorities also differently, depending on where their life journey is taking them. Beautiful. Thank you. And this is the point in the conversation where if we were in person, Nina, you'd be you'd be opening up the conversation to folks in the room and and you know, as as a way to wrap, we'd like to thank you very much for uh, for joining in the conversation and for um, 
showing an interest in what uh, Deborah and Candy and Natasha had to share. Um, this has been a short time together, and we really want to keep the conversation going for those who are interested in learning more or contributing ideas or asking questions of folks on the panel. We've set up a uh, group in LinkedIn. The QR code on this slide is going to bring you to the registration page for that uh, for that group. And um, and that's that's a place where this conversation can live long beyond today. So we look forward to seeing you there. Um, anyone got anything to throw in before we wrap? No. Okay. Thanks for setting up the QR code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's a thank you, Natasha. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.